And now, Deborah Cobalt Live. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on Deborah Cobalt Live. Wonderful guest we've got joining us, Dr. Gabia Tolikita. Thank you so much for being here, doctor. It's great to be here. Hi, everyone. Hi, and you're calling in from the UK about your fabulous book, Why the, you know what, Can't I Change? Um, great question. We all ask ourselves that, like, why the F can't I change? And you're here to tell us why. You are also a neuroscientist. You are a coach. And with all that you study, you put it all together so that we could figure out what's going on mm -hmm. up here so that we can make changes in our lives. Um, let's start about uh, the book. Why'd you even write it? I guess it has to do with all the practice you've had, right? In private practice. Yeah. Right? Well, first of all, this book originated from my seminars, public talks and corporate talks uh, I, I do. And um, so many attendees of my talks would come to me and say, well, now I understand why I can't, I can't just simply willpower myself to change. For a long time, I thought there was something wrong with me. Okay, so, so there was like over and over, there seems to be kind of have been a repeating comment with attendees of my seminars, as well as my cl coaching clients. And what I learned bit by bit that we have huge misconceptions about what it takes for us to create change. And I use mm -hmm. neuroscience as, as, as my tool to highlight why we are wrong with our beliefs about creating change and use coaching tools to actually help people to create a lasting change. You know, I'll get a little personal, okay? And then we're gonna dive into your book a little bit. Um, I'm wanting to take off maybe a pound or two that I put on recently. It had nothing to do with COVID, it's just about putting it on, right? Um, and I really find it hard to change the chemicals in my brain. Like for example, um, I know I shouldn't eat too many carbs and bread and whatever, but when presented with it in front of me, Whatever's going on in my brain, it's like I run for it and nothing mm. will stop. And I know that that's a brain thing that I have to change, but I can't seem to get in front of it. What do you do in a case like that when, well, you know to do the right thing, yes. but you're not doing it, you know? So basically, let's look at your inner dialogue because in the brain, the brain looks like that, right? It's quite an ugly organ and it, it has many different parts but we can group them into three major classes. All the wrinkly bit on the outside, the human brain is the smartest part and the most evolved part. And that's the part, especially the one at the front that tells you, don't eat those carbs, choose something better. You know, like you will feel better, you will look better, you will be happy about it in the future. Now, the deeper within there, there is other parts and they can be grouped in so-called mammalian brain or mammal brain for short. And these are the ones we say, you know what? eat as much as you can now. And that these are the parts that want you to seek immediate pleasure, immediate reward. And it does, if this part disagrees with the frontal part, often, especially if we are tired and run down or in emotionally somewhat um, compromised state, this part is going to win the show. Because the part on the outside, which enable us to resist temptation and have willpower and seek long-term objectives as opposed to short-term gratifications, requires enormous amounts of energy. And mm. we can't use it all day long. We can use it about four to six hours a day. So oh. at the end of the day, when you're you know, tired of doing your shows and giving interviews and, and, and doing all the brilliant work you do, it's unrealistic for you to expect to make rationally smart choices unless you really take loads of breaks during the day and and make sure you get a lot of replenishment for your human brain parts so they are not exhausted so you can still still have that chance so well, there is managing that conflict between those two areas that's what ultimately brings bring us back to reverting to the old habits and also seeking immediate rewards immediate gratification how do we do that? For example, the front part always seems to win out with me, right? It's like, oh, well, the heck with it tomorrow. And I'm, I'm really trying, right? I'm, I'm talking to myself. I'm sitting yeah. myself down. Do you really need it? Do you really want it? And whatever's going on with the, the, the fighting within my brain, that part always wins out where it's like, go ahead, yeah. go for yeah. it. Well, and I want to control yeah. it. I have to control it. So go ahead. What do I do? Well, it means you're getting a lot of needs met through those habits, 
with any habit, ah. no matter how bad it seems, uh, we get some important needs met or else we wouldn't do it. Okay. In simple cases, it could be just like, you know, quick uh, hit of pleasure. But in a lot of cases is emotional soothing, safety, um, feeling kind of, for, you know, being able to relax and switch off and so on. So we first we need to realize what are you meeting via eating carbs? And the, the way we can do that, we can look at the so-called the habit loop. So in habit loop, there is a trigger. When do you mm. crave for carbs? Is it when you're tired? Is it when you're stressed? Is it when you're lonely? Is it when you have had a conflict with somebody before? So what happens before? Believe it or not, for me, um, I feel like it's my own personal therapy session. Yeah, but for, for me, um, when I'm happy, because I think that's how I was raised, right? With lots of Italian, right? Association. Like lots of Italian people. They're always, you know, happy and lots of them around. And there was always food that seemed to appear mm. out of nowhere. And to me, it was a happy time. So if I'm happy and I'm eating, I'll just keep going. You know what I mean? It's almost like I'm in a rush to get to the end. But yeah. for me, like people think, oh my God, you must be sad or whatever. It's like, no, just the opposite. It's like, ah, a happy time, grab the food. So I'm trying to talk myself mm. out of that, right? Logically. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Because and I know I'm not alone, which is yeah. why I'm using my, yeah. myself as an example. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think with that is a little bit trickier. So it's probably ah. associations. What are these associations with? Are they with the happy times with the family, with friends, yeah. with other people? So could it be to do con with connection? Association mm. that you, were co you felt connected because a lot of us, right? We feel really happy if we're eating with other people and there is yeah. a lot of nice food. And when we form that association, oh, when I ate this delicious pizza and spaghetti and all that, I felt really good because I, I had all my family around me, all my friends around me. And that could be not necessarily happiness per se, but that feeling of being connected to others. That could be, mm. it could be something else. So we have to get even deeper than that. And if we, let's imagine, like, let's imagine, you know, that it was connection with other people you felt when you were happy and having meals together with other Italian people. It, it, then asking yourself, how can I get more connection in my life now? So instead of eating, you know, you feel, you feel um, in a good mood and you feel, oh, you know what, I'll have this pizza or whatever, whatever your favorite meal is. Um, and instead of asking, aha. Uh -huh, it might mean that I don't get enough connection right now. How oh. can I get, get more connection? In fact, if you're in your, you know, at, at home on your own, it could be having a Zoom call with somebody and having dinner with somebody else. It could be calling a friend and saying, you know what, let's just meet in the restaurant and getting connection met first. And bit by bit, what, you, you, what your brain needs to do, which takes time, you need to wire in healthier food choices with connection okay so i love this this so is great i think i think we need to really honor the habits we have the ones which we kind of despise because we don't continue them for no good reason and yeah. those the habits these habits meet some really really important needs we have if we didn't need them we would mm -hmm. we would be crazy these are essential needs for us right connection, safety, variety, fulfillment, significance, and so on. Uh, so so, so a, a lot of times, if not all of the times, we, we kind of make those choices to meet those needs in the ways we have met in the past. And it might not be serving as much anymore. So we need to really debug that and really go in the history of our habit formation. Right. And that's what you do. I know when you coach people, that's what mm -hmm. you talk about in your book. Um, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a process, right? You don't just snap your fingers and, and no. stop a certain behavior. Cause I know I can't. Um, yeah. And by the way, for anyone listening and for anyone where this resonates, once you do get to the point where you can understand what you're doing, cause I've been there too. Right. I just kind of fell off the wagon. Um, once you get to that point, it's almost a little easier to stay there. Right. Do you, do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In different states, we kind of, it's almost like in certain mental, emotional states, 
all the other habits we had when we were in that state in the past surface. So when yeah. people get in somewhat, let's say, depressed like state, uh, they usually have so many habits that they're like, I'm overwhelmed, I can't, I don't even know what to change. But once they are in a better state emotionally and mentally, suddenly a lot of those habits are not an issue anymore. Suddenly they start making healthier choices, food wise, which people to hang out, productivity wise, and so on. So sometimes it's also like about realizing what state am I at? And right. therefore, and if you if we manage to get in a better state, it's much easier to keep on rolling. Um, then the, and and then some some issues that were uh, problems in the other state can no longer be existent. Very interesting. Now let's take uh, mm -hmm. take a look at. Uh, some of the chapters in your book, why the whatever, um, I can't change. What a great title this is. Ooh, I love it. Because we all say it that way, right? Why the F can't I change? Um, so hang on. I love that you've uh, dedicated this to your family, whom uh, I'm hopeful has been helpful to you in your life. I love that you've done that. Um, in chapter one, and we talked about that a little bit, about changing the loop, the habit loop, right? In your brain. So we went through that a little bit, I think, when you and I spoke, but also changing your emotions, right? That's in chapter two, eight types of human emotions that either serve us well or don't, but either way, we've got eight of them, right? We've got to deal with them. What are the main ones that very often people feel like they have to get under control? Yes, yeah, so there is different models and they classify differently, but, but you know, the, the, the main existing model is that we have eight emotions that are have been formed to ensure our survival if we if we kind of you know look at evolutionary theories it wasn't random who survived who did not and emotions right. were basically there let's look at the point of emotions to warn us really really quickly what's dangerous what's not what mm -hmm. can increase your survival what won't so based on that emotions could be sadness anger aggression uh, excitement, disgust, um, love and connection, uh, and so on. So those different emotions, they either warn us against the things are not, that are not good for us, or they actually want to attract us to things that are good for us. So pleasure and excitement and are drawing us towards it. And, and love and connection also drawing us toward, towards it. So each of those emotions is actually useful. Some of them we don't like feelings such as, jealousy, anger, disgust, sadness, but they are telling us something. If you're sitting in the, at home and you feel guilt, it might be telling you that you have done something that's not congruent with your value system. Because mm. if you imagine in the tribal times, if, if we go back, you know, uh, 10,000 years ago, when we lived in small communities, if you've done something um, that benefited you more than you deserved, you impaired your relationships in the tribe and your survival could be severely impaired as a result. And even these days, you know, that's the case. So guilt told you, you shouldn't do it again, basically. Mm. If you sit at home and feel sad or sit at work, you're sitting at work and you feel sad because the job you're doing is not fulfilling to you. Sadness is telling you, you're not in the right place. You need to do something about it. But now imagine the problems occur not when we feel those emotions, but what we do when we feel them. If when we feel sad, we suddenly take a chocolate bar and eat it. So to escape that sadness, emotional escapism, the problem doesn't dis disappear. And in addition to that, we start forming habits, which later on have drawbacks. But if when you feel sad, say, you know what? What about it? There's no working because I only feel sad at work, let's imagine. And start really questioning, or oh, maybe maybe I'm extrovert and stuck in the, just working, you know, in front of computer all day long. That's not good for me. Maybe I could have, you know, a job where I could train people and work with people instead. So hmm. basically using emotions to guide us through what is not working and what's working. It, that's what I took in that chapter of the book about and how to use the emotions to really tailor your life to actually be fulfilling for you. You know, it's interesting. A lot of times people will say, oh, you're sad. You already you changed your job and you're still sad. Take a pill. What do you say about that? Because 
I don't know. I often think that in modern society, we're too quick to push a pill on somebody when in fact, just as you said, there's a reason maybe behind feeling sad. What do you think about that? It depends. So there is I, in the chapter when when I talk about the brain health, I talk mm. about the difference between emotions and moods. So emotions are usually very short term and quick and tell us about specific situation. So let's imagine I go to my work and I feel sad. That's emotion. But if mm -hmm. you wake up day after day after day and you just feel sad and you can't shake that sadness off, that's mood. So moods are often indicate what's your brain chemistry. And a lot of things can influence that. Of course, lifestyle can influence that. Uh, our, you know, how well we're meeting the needs in our life. Uh, but also sometimes just simple things like a, a digestive system issues can actually cause that when we don't, don't absorb nutrients well and other things. Mm. So if it is mood, a pill can help to push us into the better neurochemical state where, where we're much more aware what does work, what works for us, what doesn't work. But if we start to use, use antidepressants when we just sort of, we're sad as an emotion, that we kind of basically, you know, we have this compass and we're basically checking it away. Hmm. That's great. So it really you, depends. You, you mentioned foods because, um, you know, you talked in chapter five about changing your brain health, right? Neurotransmitters for good moods. Um, what does that mean, neurotransmitter for good moods? And also, um, you also mentioned foods. Are there specific foods that are kind of like a pick-me-upper um, that you would recommend? You know, there's so many different nutritionists out there um, telling you to do this, telling you to do that. But you're a scientist and you study the brain. Is there something in particular that you might even recommend and say, you know what, try this? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, um, neurotransmitters are chemicals in the brain that help to send the message across. And if we lack specific different neurotransmitters, there is about 60 different types. They are involved in different things. So for example, serotonin, as, as a lot of you came across, helps us to have a good mood. Dopamine is what causes pleasure and so mm. on. So and if we have very small amounts of those neurotransmitters, uh, less than usual, we suddenly those things are impaired. So the classical example is when people are depressed, they have less serotonin and less dopamine. And things mm. that used to cause them pleasure normally don't mm. cause any pleasure whatsoever. And that's because of those neurotransmitters being reduced. Now, neurotransmitters, are some of them are partly produced in your gut and then later on transported into your brain and, and finalized to be produced. So in, in the chapter about nutrition, I mainly discuss what things are, can actually upset your gut. Hmm. I look at the kind of problems that might be. So for example, for some people, dairy is no-no. And in my family, unfortunately, my, my husband and me, we can't have dairy. We can hmm. get really upset, upset stomach. Now you'd say, oh, it's just upset stomach. You know, let's live with that. But actually it changes microbiome of your gut, which later on doesn't allow you to absorb vitamins and nutrients very well, which impairs a lot of cognitive processes. And also the neurotransmitter, so-called precursors, so kind of molecules before the neurotransmitter is created. They're not being produced as effectively if your gut is not healthy. So... In, in, in that chapter, I give like a questionnaire, okay, like observe, do you get bloated? If so, what have you eaten before? Does anything really kind of upset your digestive system? If so, what could that be? So the most common things are uh, uh, gluten, which is kind of in wheat, um, uh, dairy. And for some people, they also have a very strong inflammatory response of the gut, which is unfortunately caused by sugar for a lot of people. So, mm. so overall, majority of people could do with reducing sugar. Actually, some people need to really do, you know, kind of do away without uh, refined sugar. And needless to say, you know, sugar is one of the most e effective drugs in triggering pleasure. Therefore, a lot of people really struggle to give that away. So, mm. so, so that's, that's kind of one takeaway thing. Now, if you ask me, is there a sort of magical thing that could help you uh, work better, it really depends. So 
overall in this book, kind of the main idea is there is no one size fits all. You really need to see what your what issues you have, and based on that, we can troubleshoot and I and mm. kind of guide you through with specific coaching type questions to figure out your own solutions. Now, talk about pleasure. This is sort of a little ad that I'm doing in the middle of my podcast. Um, we have quite a few sponsors here on Deborah Cobalt Live, and one of them is about shopping, right? FayertyBrand.com slash Deb. If anybody wants to go shopping, because it helps your pleasure center in there, please look up FayertyBrand.com slash Deb, and we'll be talking more about that later on in my podcast but I wanted to give a, a plug to them. They're wonderful. All of their fabrics are made of cotton and linens and they're all organic and honest to God. When I shop there, I actually feel better because it's also sort of their whole, you know, the meaning behind everything they do is organic and family and I just love it. So I'll talk about that later, but I did want to just mention that. Um, thank you for letting me do I that. Do, I do get a lot of pleasure from shopping, I have to admit. <laughs> I know it depends upon I happen to be someone who truly enjoys everything that feels like natural fabrics you know I get excited I really get excited by it and and I love sort of natural colors you can see that they were dyed naturally so that's actually why I like that brand in particular um so yeah shopping is a lot of fun it can always be overwhelming to me sometimes so online is always great too mm. but um uh decision making you know, the difference between rational decisions, emotional decisions, um, unconscious, you know, things, sometimes we make decisions. What about those of us sometimes who can't make a decision because we're overwhelmed? Um, what, what's going on there and how can we sort of help ourselves? Yes. Yeah, so we come back. Get back. To the, yeah. So we come back to the different brain areas. So yeah. we can either use the front of the brain, prefrontal cortex, to think through pros and cons. So let me give you an example. When we were choosing which house to buy with my husband, you know, we listed number of houses and written down the criteria we have and scored one to 10 on each criteria, each of the houses, and then summated and seen which one of them had higher score. So that so-called decision um, making system two or rational system which basically is based on all those rational rules, but it requires quite a lot of energy and deliberation and thinking things through. Now, second system, the other system is, is so-called gut instinct. So, mm. and actually that's how we ended up buying a house. You see the house, <laughs> you just love it, right? And it just feels right. That's how we ended up, you know, getting together with my husband. We met and we fell in love. It just something was really magical. So that's so-called decision-making system one. That system does not originate in your heart or in your gut. It in fact originates in brain areas within the mammal brain that you know regulate the, the kind of sense anything in your body, all the sensations in your body, like increased heart rate, you know, sweatiness and so on, and makes gives observes everything what's happening and compares it to your past. And if it matches enough criteria from the past, it just communicates to you in the language of emotions as opposed to rational thought. And that's why mm. we often can't, can't really explain why, why this house feels better than other houses if we made decision using the system. So we all have those two systems. And depending which one you use more, more frequently, you become more and you train that more and more. Now, when we talk about the per personal happiness and personal fulfillment, often emotional system needs to be involved. Mm -hmm. because it could be, you know, a, a good example could be meeting somebody and on the paper, they tick all the boxes, but not feeling anything for them. Right. And the rational system wouldn't create a feeling as such. Um, so, so we need both systems. However, Imagine if you've been uh, raised in the family where you experienced a lot of pain and a lot of trauma. Okay? All of us experience some level of trauma. Now, emotional system often wants to recreate past experiences. So emotional system can also lead us to kind of getting to the similar situations where we feel pain over and over again. So 
sometimes we actually need to stop ourselves from making those decisions and saying, you know what, I've made enough mistakes using the system in the past. I need to actually learn and make better choices now. So we need to sometimes kind of fight, you know, those and, and make a decision and fight with which system to use. Um, so in, in the kind of chapter on decision making, I kind of discuss basically how to do emotional healing so you could be, make better choices using emotional system. Uh, and also, if you constantly keep getting stuck in so-called analysis paralysis, when you can, you really can't can't make those choices, what to do about that? You know how to really, and the, the the answer is usually we get stuck in that when we're in emotionally depleted state, such as exhausted, to have too much on our plate, and then it requires really kind of tweaking and you know trimming the the diary and really kind of addressing the lifestyle as well. I mean, sleep is everything, right? You've got to get your sleep. Very often, I don't get enough sleep. You know, I'm up later doing what I think I need to do. I get up early to exercise and I've been pushing myself and saying, I'm cutting myself off. It's like, no, it's time to go to bed now. Time mm -hmm. not to eat eat past this time. I mean, it requires discipline is what it comes down to. And that, that's hard for a lot of people, but, um, you know, I guess we have to do it, right? And find a way to do it. And I know a lot of these tools are in the book. Now, I have to ask you, as a neuroscientist, you have dissected more than your share of brains, right? Um, yes. <laughs> um, but that's awfully interesting work. I mean, can you see when you're dissecting, let's say, a human brain, for example, um, the differences in behavioral patterns based on the brain? Can you actually see that? So I wasn't really working with human brains. I worked were not. with okay. of zebra fish, little fish. Uh, in, in the lab where we did research on Parkinson's disease, I worked with brains of, uh, of mice and rats, where we worked on memory and navigation. Um, and based on the structure, you can't really tell very much, actually. Structure is just one mm. part of the story. But if you put small electrical wires in different parts of the brain with, with uh, animal models, or use brain imaging techniques with human so-called uh, fMRI of uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging. You can see activity in different areas go on and off, on and off. So wow. based on that, you can tell a lot. You know, for example, you can have uh, a person in the brain scanner and asking them, and let's imagine they're watching a movie. For different people, different brain areas would light up based on the, the unique brain wiring, the, the brain past experiences, and what things they notice, what things they miss out on. So we can tell a lot more from brain functioning uh, imaging as opposed to structure. We can tell some things based on the structure as well, but that's a little bit more, uh, that's a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. So interesting. So, um, you do coaching. Tell me a little bit about your coaching and the types of people that you coach and what they yeah. come to you with. And, and is there a process to it? Like, you know, you give them homework because I know coaching is very different than therapy, right? So talk yeah. me through briefly about what you do when you coach your clients. So I started coaching during my PhD at University, ah. University College London in London when, when I was still doing my PhD. And my clients back then were... Uh, university professors and department heads. So at university, we had a scheme where staff were trained to coach other staff members to deal with mm. specific problems. And um, after that, I started my own company where I mainly was working with people changing careers and business owners. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to be honest, now the list, you know, expanded. Uh, I've coached a lot of professional athletes, a lot of self-employed people, still a lot of people career confused come, come and reach out to me and people who want to kind of overcome the emotional patterns. And in my coaching sessions, what we do, we usually look at what's basically, why did they get in the place they got to in the first place? So we really look hmm. what, has, what has happened. So we do inventory of the existing habits and what they're serving them. And then we look really through how we can replace them and rewire specific networks and create a process to actually create a lasting change, but that takes time. So there is homework, hmm. there is 
you know, and we focus, usually we start with focusing on one thing and then kind of grow, grow from that. Hmm. So it's, 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 it's kind of um, getting insights, but some now kind of lately I've been doing quite a lot of just one-off sessions to help right. people show insights where they got stuck and they use my book as a tools then to really debug those areas. So that's another, another thing I do as well. Well, I had my favorite chapters for using your book. I will tell you because um, there are some answers I was looking for and it made mm -hmm. sense to me. And it's also allowing me to sort of stop and take a pause at certain behaviors that I'm trying to understand or change or connect with. But I want people to know there's a lot in this book that they can learn. Um, how you can change some of the results, change relationships. You talk about leadership, relationships, change how you communicate. I mean, you really don't have time to go through everything, but I would implore people to please pick up this book. Why the F can't I change? Um, because I think a lot of us ask ourselves that every day, or they mm. might say to somebody else, why the F can't you change? Well, here's the book, you know, buy it for yourself, buy it for them. Uh, very interesting. Um, <laughs> any, any other words uh, that you'd like to tell my audience before we let you go? Yes, just, just the last thing. So this book, my biggest wish for this book really is that people who read it will really get to know themselves better and That's get right. to acknowledge the, and I use, you know, kind of neuroscience and a lot of practical examples from my clients and my, my own and other, other stories. But my biggest wish that by reading this book, not only you will kind of get to know and understand your behavior better, but really would learn, would kind of start to like and love yourself more because mm -hmm. a lot of things we disown a lot of traits we disown is because we don't understand how they're serving us right Once we start to see bigger picture and 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 realize that actually brain is a lot smarter than we think it is and it takes really quite some time to untangle it to realize we start to see the logic and the purpose in our actions and even mis what we call mistakes mm -hmm. and that so it's, it's almost like a paradox in order to change we really need to accept who we are first right and and that's my biggest wish actually for all the readers to learn about yourself by learning about your brain to have practical tools of actually how to create that change and to really to accept and acknowledge you for who you are and also other people for who they are. Right. And that's creating a meaning, meaningful change in your life as opposed to change we think we should accomplish. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And please, everybody, pick up this book. I ask this question all the time. I know probably most of you do too. Why the F can't I change? And I know, doctor, you're available probably on your social media channels, right? If people want to reach out to you, correct? Yes, of course, people can, can find me. Okay, beautiful. Uh, why the F can't I change? Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for joining us. It must be a little late there, calling us over from the UK. So thanks for taking this time. Yeah, and thanks all, uh, absolutely. And thanks all of you for joining us on Deborah Cobalt Live. Before I let you go, uh, just a little commercial that we have about fairtybrand.com slash Deb for a special uh, discount. So please take a look at that and then we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye everyone. I love our latest collaboration, Fairty. I'm so obsessed with their products that over the weekend I purchased everything from hats, shorts, sundresses, and even a few shirts for my husband at their Malibu store close to where I live. At Fairty, summer is in their DNA, and everything from their blankets to shorts and tees are beautifully woven organic materials, and that's everything to me. Fairty is about family, and I was so excited to learn that the family who actually started Fairty were from Spring Lake, New Jersey, where I spent so many summers as a kid. And they care about what I care about, simple Top quality clothes for every day, for travel, casual evenings, just the way we live in our family. So please shop FairtyBrand.com and make sure to put in the code DEB20 for your special discount. And happy summer.